My name is Tina Jellison. I am from Jamaica. I came to this country in 1960. I came and went to the exchange to sign on. And I came here as a qualified stenographer. And when I went to the exchange, and the lady asked me, what would I like to be doing? I told her I'm a stenographer and I would like to get into that. And she smiled. And I was very annoyed when I see this smile on her face. And she whispered to me and said, they don't use black people in offices here anymore. That calmed me down. And I realized that I have to choose something. I didn't know what to choose. So I went out up there, not knowing what I was going to do. When we came to discovery, England was our mother country because I'm from Jamaica and England was our mother country. And so therefore we came here, not realizing that we'd reach that point where people are telling us to go back to our own country. We did not realize that would happen. My name is Joyce Morris Wisson. I was born in Jamaica and came over in the um, 60s after my mom and dad um, came here. Life at the time um, for a woman and as an African-Caribbean woman was um, very difficult. Women had to go out to work um, to help support um, the family home and not just the men because men couldn't get the jobs that they wanted to. So it was quite um, challenging but an important part uh, for a woman as well. Like when we go shopping, I myself have experienced it. You'd give the money in their hands, but the change you'll put on the counter because they were fearful that um, our skin would cut off our skin would rub off. So we had to take the money back off, off the counter. It was difficult to be a woman. I was looking flat to let in those days and I, I would ring up and I spoke to them and uh, they tell me to come for the keys to have a look and I went and when she saw that I was black she ran into the back of the office and the man came out and said to me sorry it's gone so we called Owen Henry into this and he came and uh, he introduced him one of his friends I forget what the reporter name but the reporter rang up about the key as well. And they told, yes, it's vacant, he could come for it. And when he went, they gave him the key. And he called me from outside and said to them, do you realize this, do you recognize this lady? Because she came for the key this morning and you did not give it to her, you told her the place was gone. So all that was in where people or beating prejudice. Going on the buses, they didn't want to sit beside us because they thought um, there was something strange about us. So we'd sit on the buses. They would, didn't want to sit if there was a seat. And if they did sit, they didn't sit very close to us. So it was coming at us all the time, in the shops, on the streets, everywhere. Sometimes we were told to even go back to the country where we came from. I explained that um, although this is not my country at birth, this is still my country. I went on the bus one morning, just before the boycott actually come into place. And I, the first seat I saw, I sat down. And the driver jumped out of his seat and told me that I had to sit at the back of the bus. I didn't realize what happened then. So I got up and sit at the back of the bus, not realizing that it was, they didn't want black people to sit in the front of the bus. But that's what happened. And in those days, you get a lot of that. And we did not realize exactly what was going on. The bus boycott came about. A guy, Bailey, um, wanted to join the omnibus um, company as a bus driver and he didn't get the opportunity to even um, have an interview. He overheard um, being told by the um, boss that they don't employ what was called colored people at the time. My husband then was a friend of Guy and I remember he come telling my husband that 
I he did not get the job because they said they don't employ black people there. We were meeting prejudices, but not that bad that you couldn't get a job anywhere. You know, and people were very annoyed about it. And because of that, we decided to have marches and um, boycott the buses. So instead of catching the buses to go to work, we would walk to work. The bus says they weren't racist, and the tea transport workers and general union, they also supported the bus company. Then we decided that we'll um, take action by doing a peaceful process. So I decided I'd like to go. Um, I needed permission and I got permission from my mom and the school. So a lot of us women used to be there marching from St. Paul's into Bristol and holding up banners. And uh, I was working in a hospital at the time and I remember holding up manners in front of my face so that nobody wouldn't see that it's me. Eventually the um, union and the bus company gave in and um, as a result of that from the peaceful march we contributed to the race relation act of 1965. i remember it because i remember meeting tony ben and tony ben was the one that introduced us the people from the bristol boycott to mr wilson who was the president at the time tony ben has helped us to reach this far in life he has asked Mr. Wilson, and Mr. Wilson is the one who decided that there should be some laws about black people and about racism in this country. My name is Evadne Hartley. I was nicknamed Cherry from birth. Because of this fighting to get black people on the buses, you can imagine the prejudice we had to encounter with the passengers. One working in different places, one seemed to look for better jobs each time, wherever the money is flowing. <laughs> So after whatever was going on, they were recruiting people on the buses. One day if they'll have me. <laughs> so I went to, and I said to the man, he said, can I help you? I said, I'm looking for a job. He said, oh yes, what kind of a job? I said, well, I heard that you are recruiting people. I would like to work on the buses. Okay, he gave me mental arithmetic. How many passengers I am giving at so much, with so much money given to me, how much change would I be giving back? <laughs> so I was very good at mental arithmetic at home, at school. And while he was there talking, I'm working my arithmetic, so I told him. He said, what? I said, that's the answer. And he swore. <laughs> he said, bloody head, how did you do that? So I said, I still have a brain here, you know. I got the job. I had to go to the school for one week up in Lawrence Hill to be taught about Bristol and everything, what you can do from what you can't do. And the teacher was always looking at me because I was the only donkey there. And I thought, why is he looking at me like that? I did so hard, I just looked at him and I thought, well, he read my mind. He said, um, you thought I'm picking at you. <laughs> he said, um, I'm not picking at you, but the road you will be on is a rough road. What? That's frightening. Well, the bus that I generally is on, it's the 977. I call it the killer bus because that is the bus that takes the footballs, the children. Some of the conductresses, they come and say, do you know what bus you have? I said the 977 court. 
I said, why? And one lady said, look at me. Because she was all in blotches. I said, what's the matter with you? He said, it's the children did this to me. I said, what? How? She said, well, they tripped me. I said, you let the children trip you on the bus. Oh, what did you do? What could I do? I said, stop the bus, put them off, run the empty bus back in the depot. You were told that in school. Yes, but they are kids. I said, well, they don't behave like kids, so they wouldn't be treated like kids. At one time, there were three buses in front of us off. They're on the road, but when they go up and see the crowd, they just go, leaving the passengers. So when we reach up there, and the driver said, huh, what do we do? I said, pick them up. Anyway, I let them start coming in, cussing the place down, cussing, cussing, cussing. Then to this man, I said, what time are you waiting for your bus? Told me, I said, did you see the three of them pass leaving you? I said, it's because I have a heart why I stopped to pick you up. So shut it or else I'll put you off this bus. Oh, you can't do that. And I should get muck on my banana boat. <laughs> That's what he said. He was really hungry off, off. So I stopped the bus. I gave the driver three bells and he stopped. I said, now you are getting off here. Your insult is enough. So you're getting off. I can't make him. I said, I, can, I, I don't have to touch you. So nobody's going anywhere. So this bus will be stopped here until my duty is finished. And the passengers begin to get mad at him. <laughs> so he got off because he said I should get to Helmuck on my banana boat. And then when he went, a little school boy, he called me a black bastard. I looked at him. I said, you're getting off here too. So he got off. He said, he's going to get my dad for you. Going to get my dad to you. So I took my machine off. I said, he'll be coming to face this. Because <laughs> if, he's, if his dad is going to come to beat me up, I'm not going to stop there to be beaten up. I will use it. After those two are gone, I put my two hands up and I said, does anyone have any more words? Quiet. So the driver came out. I said to the driver, I said, if everybody is fine, we can go. Whatever you have to say, say it now. Because the next stop I make will be emptying this bus. With all that happening on the bus, I became a different person for who I was. When my duties finish and I go to bed, the daily happenings were so rough, I didn't feel like it was me anymore. I thought I had turned into some animal. Since the Bristol boycott, it's come a long way. Today, I can't complain about prejudice. It's still there, but it's not as potent as what it used to be. But I'm accepted. I live in a, a little district, and I am about the four black person that lives there. And I'm welcomed by everybody. I go to church there. I talk to people there, they are my friends. We were overjoyed that we've actually done something to change the course of history. It showed that, you know, we can break down barriers. It showed that it can bring people together. And it showed that, you know, people are people. You know, we're not second-class citizens. We're not different from anybody else. It's just the color of our skin.